Okay, Mr. Ackerman. Good morning, Your Honor. May I proceed? Yes, you may. May it please the court. My name is Doug Ackerman, and I have the privilege of representing EHC Inc. this morning. Uh, with me watching remotely are my co-counsels, Rachel Lokanen and Louis D'Augustina. And also observing remotely are the principals of our company, uh, Tony Hamilton and Jeff Hunt. I would like to reserve uh, three minutes for rebuttal, if I may, Your Honor. You may. Thank you. This is a construction law case, and we asked the court to reverse four errors made by the trial judge. The first error is the trial judge's failure to set off the contract balance against KB Homes damages. The law is well settled in this area that the owner's measure of damages is the difference between the contract price and the amount paid. For some reason, the trial judge got it in her head um, that retainage was somehow the appropriate measure of damages. It is not. It is completely irrelevant. There is not one. Can, can you, I'm going to stop you right there because everybody has assumed that that we understand what retainage is. I I don't understand what you're referencing. I mean, I think I have a general idea, but would you specifically explain it to me? Thank you, Judge. Yes, retainage are amounts earned by the contractor but held by the owner until the conclusion of the project. So in other words, when you submit an invoice for payment, they pay a portion of it, but they hold back a portion and that's the retainage? Yes, Your Honor, typically 10%. Okay, all right. I wanted to make sure I understood what you were talking about. And while we're, yes. while we're on count one, let me see if I can clear up something as well. You, you're claiming that the contract balance of 672,437 should have been the amount of the offset instead of the much lesser amount of the retainage, is that right? Yes, Your Honor. And can you just explain your, your thinking on that for a moment? Again, retainage has nothing to do with the contract price. Retainage is relevant to the amount earned. It has nothing to do with the amount that the owner agreed to pay for the work. So the proper measure of damages is the contract price, regardless of how much of the contract is performed, minus the amount paid. That is the $673,000, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Uh, the second error is actually labeled argument three. Wait, so let, wait let me stop you because I, I act, I'm gonna just be candid with you. I sort of struggled with the damage arguments in this case. Yes, Your Honor. Your, your, I wanna make sure I understand your position. Your position is that the measure of KB's damages is the contract price less the amount paid? That's that's the measure of their damages? Uh, no, it is the cost to complete in excess of the contract balance. So until they spend- Okay, so you take the contract price, you subtract the amount paid, that's the contract balance? Yes, Your Honor. And then, uh, then whatever the cost is to complete. Yes. In other but words, is it your you, position that you completed the work? It, it is not relevant whether our client completed the work. All that matters is how much KB Home spent completing the work. So, in other words, KB Home has no damages until they exceed six hundred and seventy-three thousand. Why? Because they agreed to pay six hundred and seventy-three thousand as part of the original contract. Well, you know, I, I'm a little reluctant to get into this given the tone of some of your statements in the brief. So, but I'm going to ask my questions anyway. Uh, you, when you read this contract, as I understand it, you agreed to provide all the fill that was necessary for phases one and two. And you had done an estimate and you, you estimated you're going to need this much and it's going to cost this much and he'll, here is what we will do it for. And the contract also seems to me clearly provided that if that changed, if you needed more, that was on you. The price was fixed for that job 
for phases one and two. But then you then you ran into scheduling problems, you ran you ran into issues. So you got more fill. And and KB paid for it. You submitted change orders. You asked for more fill. They paid for more fill, even though you had a lump sum contract saying, we'll provide all the fill at this price. I'm really uh, um, not able to reconcile your argument with what's provided for in the contract documents. Uh, How is it that they owe you more money when you agreed to provide all the fill at a fixed price? Uh, we don't contend per se that they owe us more money, Your Honor. We contend, if we're still on argument one, that they have not suffered any damages until well, they, they paid pay for all this extra money for Phil. No, they did not pay six hundred and seventy-three thousand dollars. So well, they what, did they, what did they? What, what did they pay in excess of the original price that you agreed to for the Phil? That number is not revealed by the record and would require some significant math. Um, the error alleged is that the trial judge set off retainage, right, which has nothing to do with the contract balance. So what do you think the damages should be? Uh, we think that the contract balance should be set off of 673. There is a clear error in change order 17, which is argument 2A1. Was that in preserved? That, was, that, was that argued below? Yes, Your Honor. That is in the second argument on the amended motion for rehearing. In fact, the trial judge in the judgment herself said, quote, KB Holmes damages must be calculated using the same unit prices actually charged by EHC. Well, in change order 17, the amount charged was $3.17 per unit per cubic yard. Somehow the trial judge almost tripled that number. That's a $400,000 error. It's a pure legal issue. There are no facts in dispute. We had a complete accord and satisfaction of what the price for on-site fill would be. And even well, if- Wasn't that difference between the on-site fill and things that they had to, to bring in? And you're suggesting yes. that they should have been able to get it out of uh, excavating the pond further or in some other manner? Is that what you're saying the error is? Both that they could have, and second, that the measure of damages, regardless, is the amount of the price agreed to which is $3 and 17 cents a cubic yard. That this is all argued, this is all argued before the trial judge. And he found that the $9 was the more appropriate amount. Uh, there's no specific finding. In fact, a lot of the math is in the proposed final judgments in this case, your honor. But he used, he used the $9 figure. Yes, so he did. He found that. Uh, and I had one other question, if you don't mind, Judge Kelly, uh, go back on the issue of the retainage versus the contract balance. KB doesn't agree with you as far as what the contract balance is. Is that correct? Yes, Judge. Okay. Thank you. Where did Thank you get your number? Where do you get your number from for the contract balance? Uh, the um, set forth in the both the initial and the reply brief. Um, well, I t I'll have to tell you, I've read these briefs a couple times, and I I still find the damages sections of them somewhat confusing. So if you can just help me with that. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, reply brief, page two. Okay. Contract price. Five million eighty-three thousand some odd dollars. That is directly off the payment application. Amount paid four million four hundred eleven thousand. Yeah, I saw those payment applications, but I, I was, you know, I'm, I didn't see a contract with a with a price. I just saw the payment applications. So maybe I misunderstood what those actually mean. 
the payment application are the cumulative totals of the original contract, which here was only four hundred thousand dollars. Right, and then, exactly. And then all of the change orders, which turned that into a five million eighty-three thousand dollar contract, which is, by the way, not at all unusual. So the contract price is the final payment application number five million eighty-three thousand, and the amount paid is supported by both uh, the documents in the record and the testimony four million four hundred eleven thousand. To Judge Stargill's point as well, even if they are right about the number, Judge, remand is still necessary because they got a windfall on their own math. No matter what, retainage is wrong and retainage is less than what got set off. May I proceed, Your Honors? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the next clear error, uh, we believe, is in argument, what we label argument three. Case law is extremely strong, as particularly in your court, um, that in order to prove a fraudulent lien, you have to prove evil intent and a bad actor. It is also clear that advice of counsel is an affirmative defense to such a claim. And here it is absolutely undisputed that our client received the advice of counsel. There was absolutely zero cross-examination on that testimony, and there was zero other evidence offered by KB Home. So that issue is crystal clear, and under the Dorsky case, among others from this court, uh, we ask you reverse and remain with instructions to enter judgment against KB Home on that. Advice of counsel was undisputed. The next argument, uh, which we believe warrants reversal, is what's labeled argument four in our briefs, and that is the failure to plead the unsuitable materials in the building pads. Once again, the facts are very clear that the claim not only was not pled, it did not exist at the time the complaint was filed against my client. In fact, a subsequent letter, a 558 notice, was sent out acknowledging that they had just found out about it. It's further undisputed that that complaint was never amended at any time to plead this claim. And it's further undisputed that they actually sued the engineering team and received money for that exact claim. The only attempt by KB Home is to mix prejudice. That's already been addressed though, correct? I'm sorry, Your Honor the amount of money from the engineering company that was addressed in uh, the revised final judgment? The money was, yes. Our error alleged is the failure to plead, Judge. And the, But the trial court judge looked at it and thought that it was broad enough to encompass that issue. Is that correct? She did, and that's impossible. In fact, right out of KB Holmes' mouth uh, in their 558 notice, they say, we didn't know about this claim at all. So okay. they didn't plead it and they couldn't have pled it because they didn't even know about it. And then they never amended their pleadings to assert such a claim. The cases they cite do not have to do with the fundamental pleading error. They're all surprise evidence cases on matters that were pled. That's irrelevant. The error asserted is the failure to plead and we believe the record's quite clear that that can't be demonstrated. May I ask how much time I have left, Your Honor? Uh, you, hang on, you have about three and a half minutes left before you get into your rebuttal time. Thank you, Judge, that's what I had here myself. Um, turning back to uh, what we've labeled as argument two, we'd like to uh, advance two other errors that should be reversed even if you accept KB Holmes' interpretation of this contract. The first one I already made, even if you accept their interpretation of the contract, the unit price on change order 17 is legally wrong, period. Number two, even if you accept their interpretation of the contract, the rock crushing change order, RC828R, has nothing to do with it because that was never part of the lump sum contract to begin with. That is a pure add-on. It's agreed that it's a pure add-on. And it's also crystal clear from the record 
that it was partially performed. And how do we know that? Because the giant rocks did in fact get crushed. So there is no way that a finding that we performed 0% of that change order can be sustained. It is unfortunate that the change order doesn't delineate how much of the 100,000 went to crushing and how much of the 100,000 went to placing, uh, but it cannot be disputed that the rocks were crushed. I so hate to interrupt, keep interrupting you with our questions, but this is, I'm just trying to find out some of the details. So having them crushed is fine and having them distributed, but if they weren't crushed to the level that they needed, could it not be that 100,000 is still the right number? It, it could be. You've got now, I think the testimony showed that some of them were still, you know, 12 inches and they should have all been under four inches, something to that effect. It, it could be judged, but there was absolutely no evidence from anyone that the rocks complained of are traceable to this rock crushing exercise. There's 72 building paths on this project. There's dirt and rock flying all over the place. Nobody, and there's lots of expert testimony, made any effort whatsoever to say these specific rocks that were the subject of that change order are the ones that turned out to be uh, complained of. There's just not one shred of evidence. No one even attempted that. I'm not even sure it's possible. May I continue, Judge? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, the last argument that definitely requires reversal, and this again, even if you accept KB Holmes' interpretation of the contract, it's undisputed that subsequent to the original contract, KB Home changed the design, elevated the entire project so that their buyers would not have to get flood insurance. We did not receive $1 of credit for that in this final judgment. There was a dispute as to how much the credit ought to be, but it was never decided. It is undisputed from KB Home's own mouth, however, uh, that a credit would be due and they didn't provide any and the trial judge's math does not provide any. So again, even if you read the contract exactly how KB Home says, it's undisputed they changed the design after the original contract, significantly raised the entire project and we did not receive $1 of credit for that that issue should be remanded for further proceedings. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. Mr. Lang. May it please the court, Joseph Lang from Carlton Fields for KB Home. Okay, Mr. Lang, I'm gonna stop you right off the bat. Well, it's fresh in my mind. There's a couple of things I'd like you to specifically respond to. I'd like you to respond to those last points that Mr. Ackerman raised um, regarding uh, the rocks, the cr a credit for the change, um, and uh, you had one other point with respect to, I guess, their, their issue two on appeal, basically saying, you know, if you accept KB's interpretation of the contract documents, it's still, we still have these problems. So I'd like you to respond to those. And also I'm interested in you having you respond to the argument about advice of counsel. Yes, um, Your Honor. Back to the, the fraudulent lien. Right. As to all three of these supposed calculation errors, absolutely not accurate. As to the rock crushing agreement, they were supposed to crush the entire pile of rocks to the right specifications and they were going to be used in the building pads or they were gonna be left in a stockpile. We know that they were not crushed to the right specifications in the building pads because of the examination of the building pads, we find all kinds of rocks that are not crushed correctly. We know we don't have a stockpile. And there's evidence in the record that some rocks were actually thrown back in the lake, whether crushed or uncrushed, they were thrown back into a lake according to evidence from EHC. So the contract meant, was meant to provide crushed rock for the building pads or for a stockpile. We don't have a stockpile. We know the rocks in the building pads are not the right size. And we have testimony that some rocks were thrown back into the lake. This none contract- of the, None of the rocks were crushed to the correct size? 
don't know if uh, I don't think the testimony says 100 percent of the rocks were crushed to the wrong size. But we know that they were unusable because of the mix of rocks crushed to the wrong size. They were unusable in the building pads. And we know and we that's have your no basis stuff. for for claiming the entire amount for that work. Yes, they they can't be used in the building pads. There is no stockpile. The contract is not performed. Okay, and that's a fi- and that's a finding by the judge as well. I'm sorry, Your Honor. So, are you saying that there was more work required then to go back and find what happened at each of these pads? Because when you tested them, there were larger rocks. So then you had to analyze the entire foundations on the pads on all 72 of these. The pads actually had to be remediated, Your Honor. Um, and they were remediated, and that's actually part of the final judgment, the remediation part. But the rocks in there were too big, so this contract wasn't performed at all. No building pad rocks that are usable and no stockpile. So that's the rock crushing agreement. As to the FEMA elevations, uh, it's clear from Exhibit 80 that um, EHC was given credit in Exhibit 80, which is the letter to EHC about deficiencies, right in that letter, KB Home says that we realize that there's about 14,000 cubic yards of additional fill that was used because of the FEMA elevations. And that has been credited against the number of missing fill. And that letter went to EHC. There is a credit that's been given. That's at Exhibit 80. You can also see that at Exhibit 222, which is a repeat of that letter. And we have transcript sites in our brief as to where that was discussed as well. But the FEMA elevations, there was a credit given by KB. I saw the credits for the the fill. Was there any other consideration given? Was it basically the same amount of work? I mean, it seems like it would be a lot more work. Did you all adjust the contract in any manner to deal with that? I don't believe that request was ever made. Um, We used, though, to be clear, I'm not sure it is that much more work because we did not use additional fill coming in. That was actually a request by EHC is that we give them another work order to bring in additional fill. We did not agree to that work agreement. Instead, we used some of the leftover fill that we had already paid for and we gave credit towards that leftover fill. So that fill was already there on property um, that we used. It wasn't bringing in additional fill because of the FEMA elevations. So they didn't request a change order for additional work, uh, days required, et cetera, based on needing to elevate the road an additional few feet. That's That's my understanding, Your Honor. And all of this was vetted out in front of a trial judge that heard six days of evidence and testimony and wrote her own extensive order with findings of fact, as you've seen. Um, And so this has been vetted out by a trial judge that in addition, by the way, has also um, heard their counterclaims and defenses and made factual findings that they had not established their counterclaims and defenses. And I want to make sure I cover each of the subcategories that Judge Kelly asked me to, but I definitely want to get back to the damages calculation in issue one. So we've covered um, the FEMA elevation, the rock crushing, the disparity in um, cost. This actually will be a nice segue into damages methodology uh, for the replacement dirt that was not excavated from the lakes. That is a true example of a cover case, which we would argue that the primary argument on appeal is not. But here, they had special expertise where they could have excavated from the lake for the reduced amount that they agreed to do it. But having failed to do that, we don't have the expertise to go in and excavate from the lake what they failed to we get our cover cost, which is if you go out on the market and have to replace the dirt that they did not excavate, you get the market price for that. And we didn't 
have to go and find the market price on the market. We use their own price for import fill that they have in their contract. That's the argument. The trial judge, this was well vetted in front of the trial judge. And we got the cover cost that it would cost us to replace the fill they were supposed to excavate and did not. And that's the argument as to, I think, two, one. And was there, a, I'm trying to remember, is there a further calculation argument that I need to address before I go to? No, I think that's it. But I really want you to get to the, the issue of the, the advice of counsel too. Oh, advice of counsel. Yes, that, first of all, that's not an absolute defense, obviously, under this court's um, precedent. But more than well, that, you know, have- I got to tell you I, the way I'm looking at this, because I want to give you a chance to respond. Um, I mean, I've read your argument, but, you know, they had advice of counsel and you guys are still fighting over what all this stuff means. I have a hard. I mean, it seems to me there's a genuine dispute here. Look where we are. I am having a hard time reconciling what has transpired in this case with what you cited regarding a willful, you know, malicious lien claim. So can you help me with that? Tell me yes, why Your wrong. Honor. Okay. First of all, they did not establish what they gave to their counsel to look at. Um, we sent them a letter in December of 15, the Exhibit 80, that lays out everything they did not perform. And yet they still file a lien a month later less than a month later, on the assumption they performed everything. We don't even know if they gave that December 2015 letter to their counsel when they got advice of counsel. This was a factual dispute that the trial judge evaluated and decided it was willful exaggeration. We need to remember this is a statutory claim. This is not common law fraud that we're talking about, which the brief would make it sound like we're talking about common law fraud, but willful exaggeration is a statutory term. And, you know, the case law supports the idea that if you knowingly file a lien for work you didn't perform, that's willful exaggeration. But I need to make one very important final point on this issue. And that's that this issue standing alone won't change the final judgment by one penny. Uh, We didn't seek punitive damages like we could have under the statute for exaggerated lien. Reversing only on the lien issue doesn't change the final judgment one penny. And the argument that we, the argument they make in their conclusion that they still want this done because it might change prevailing party for fees in the trial court. It's hard to see how that could possibly be accurate if we maintain the final judgment in the amount that it is, we obviously would still be the prevailing party, whether we win the fraudulent lien claim or not. So it doesn't affect the final judgment, but clearly the trial judge heard all the evidence, looked at the Stevens standard, looked at the statute, and as a finding of fact, made the determination that this was willful. Is thank you. Now I'd like to go real quick to the damages methodology because I think um, that garnered a lot of questions in the initial argument. Uh, The first thing I would repeat is that their counterclaim below was for the amount that they are seeking the contract balance they talk about. That was their counterclaim below uh, for damages. The judge heard all of the evidence and ruled as a matter of fact that they had not proved their counterclaim. And so what they are trying to do with this first argument is get a credit through the back door of the very counterclaim that they tried in the trial court and the judge ruled against them and they did not appeal that determination. So that finding is res judicata, it's waived. They did not appeal the ruling as to the counterclaim, and yet they're trying to get that exact same amount as a credit. So that's the dynamic going on first. But beyond that, their rubric is just wrong. They're citing cases that are right, but they don't fit these facts for numerous reasons. Uh, The first reason is that this is not a single contract like you see in those cases. In fact, the first contract here is called the MSA 
which is a master subcontract agreement that has zero dollars associated with it. It's a master agreement between subcontractors and KB Home. And it anticipates that for each piece of work we're going to have you do, we are going to enter a standalone agreement with you for that piece of work. That this is not a build on piece of work with change orders. We are going to enter a standalone contract. It says that in the MSA, and then each work agreement that we enter, it says it on the work agreement that this is a standalone contract. You notice that we don't just accept and sign these so-called requested change orders. What we do is they file with us a requested change order, but what we enter with them is a standalone work agreement for certain elements of work. And on the face of those work agreements, it says that they are standalone contracts. So. The additional fill agreement is a standalone contract, and that is different from this universal conglomeration of a single contract, which really doesn't exist in this case. But more important, the cases they cite, and this is why the rubric is wrong, those cases assume that the work that was paid for had actually been performed. And in this case, that's not true. Here, the work we're suing about is work that we paid them for and was not performed. And I can make this easy by going to an example in their brief. Uh, yes, yeah, Judge. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I, I'll get you with my question, but go ahead. I want, maybe you'll answer it for me. Okay. Here, I have two examples that I think will make this um, very clear. The first is from their brief when they describe a cover case. This is in their summary of argument where they talk about the $500,000 home where the contractor does $300,000 worth of work and then walks off and the, the owner, the homeowner has to pay somebody $280,000 to finish the contract. And there, when you've paid for $300,000 worth of work, contractor walks off, you have to finish the contract. It costs two hundred and eighty dollars to finish. We fully agree that damages under this court's case law are limited to 80,000 in that case. But that's not our case. In our case, we paid the 300,000 and they didn't do the $300,000 worth of work. We paid the 300,000, they didn't do the 300,000 of work. So they've got prepaid. And then when we come back and seek damages, they say that you first have to subtract from your $300,000 damages that you paid us and we didn't do any work, the contract difference of 200, which would leave us only being able in our situation, using the example in their brief, of only being able to recover 100,000. It doesn't add up when you have work you prepaid for that wasn't performed. They told us they performed it, we paid for it, we then go out and find out it wasn't performed. Their rubric, their math from their cases don't work. Second example, two widgets. You agree to buy two widgets for $1,000, $500 each. You pay $900 and you get one widget from the seller. Seller doesn't <laughs> give you your two widgets. You only get one widget. So you have to go on to the open market to find a widget and it costs you $600 to find your second widget. So you now are $1,500 in because you performed the payment for the two widgets and they didn't give you the widgets. So you had to pay not only the 900 that you overpaid to the original seller, you pay 600 more to go find the second widget. So you're at $1,500 in damages or you're at $1,500 out of pocket and you seek your $600 in damages that you had to pay to cover. And they say, no, there's still a thousand, I mean, a hundred dollars left on that original contract, even though we didn't perform with the second widget and we get a credit for that hundred dollars. Frank, you just can't make this work. Their formula only works if what was, paid for was actually performed. Well, now, now let me, let me just, boy, I've got an echo, sorry. Um, I don't know where that's coming from. Uh, 
you have confused me with your argument about, you know, we paid them and they didn't do the work. But I think maybe what you're, and help me, correct me if I'm wrong. I think what you mean is they did all the work that was required for phase one and two. They completed that, they did that, they got paid for that, and they got paid even more. And the additional money that came through the change orders that they were paid, the work that was done there went to, to, to phase one and two, but the idea was that it would, it would generate fill for down the road for phase three and four. And that's what you're saying. They got paid for work in, that was for three and four that never got done because there was no fill left. Is, is that absolutely, absolutely correct? Absolutely correct. But I'm trying to react to their argument that there's this contract total out there. Right. Well, I, I, I understand that. And, and, and so what you did to try to quantify, because nobody really knows how much fill was supposed to be left, right? Oh, well, we do. We, the amount well, we, well, didn't you just look at how much you had somebody do a survey or whatever and look at how much went into one and two over and above what you thought, what they thought was needed. And, and that was supposed to be the excess. Well, the amounts on the additional fill agreement, um, that work agreement is what we're suing on. And all okay. of that was supposed to be left because all of, all of that contract is supposed to be left because it was only a scheduling agreement, which is we will pay you more to keep this project on schedule. But then those so all amounts. Of that, all of that extra fill should have been credited to three and four. Correct. Minus, minus whatever exhibit 80 shows that you gave them a credit for, for the changes that you made to the elevations. Is that Correct. right? Correct. So, okay, I think I have it. Maybe. Right, and all, of, and all of that was done in this final judgment and the retainage that we, I know that that's a strange word. Yeah, talk but about the money, that. But the money we held back along the way we gave them a full credit for that money on this amended final judgment. You can see that money credited on the final judgment along with the set off. So there's a credit for the set off. There's a credit for all the money we retained on the final judgment. So they've already gotten credit for those two numbers. The rest of their numbers, by the way, are incorrect in the brief. And we make that point in our brief, but they're using wrong numbers, which is how they are creating this purported $672,000 gap, which well, is wrong. Somebody, somebody used the phrase two ships passing in the night. I Can use that agree? phrase. Yeah, very true. Um, it's, it's pretty but, frustrating for us when that occurs, by the way. Well, I will reiterate let, let that we, at the end of our brief, I'm sorry, Your Honor. About phases three and four, is it documented somewhere in the record the amount of fill that was supposed to go towards three and four? I, I saw repeatedly where there was an understanding or an agreement or a hope or an assumption that some of this fill would be, there, there would be a sufficient amount to use some of it in future projects, but I don't know where that amount is recorded or if it is. Well, exhibit... Um, Exhibit 33 is the work agreement for the additional fill. And the way the additional fill agreement came about, Your Honor, was they came to us right, with- I understand. I understand that part. Okay. Opportunities to get a better deal, to keep on schedule and to have some fill left over. I just could never find where the amount of the fill was documented. The amount of fill in exhibit- for in exhibit 33, three which is, I'm sorry. That was supposed to be used to three, for, for phase three and four. Right. Those amounts are the amounts listed in the work agreement um, for the additional fill, which is work agreement 33 and the requested change order that's attached to it. The amounts of additional fill that we bought, those are the amounts that should have been left over, but for the credit that we, you know, we did a calculation as to what fill should have been left over. And that calculation gave a credit for that FEMA additional fill. And that, you can see that reflected in exhibit 80, which is the letter we sent in December. Okay. 
but are, are, are the are the damages recorded under item one in the in the final judgment? Is are those the damages that pertain to that fill? Yeah, I, the 509, 851 and the 566, 120. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. All right. All right. You're me, about at the end of your time. As to the plea, I, I just want to check those two numbers that the judge just asked okay, me about. Okay, that's fine. It's on page 12 of the, of the court order. Correct. On record 5282, those are, those are the amounts. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. As to the pleading issue, I think that's the only one I haven't touched on. Uh, we clearly pleaded that we had a problem with the way they crushed and handled the rock. That is an express allegation in the complaint. We were not as specific as mentioning building pads at that point in time, but you can't have the right size rock in the building pads if you don't crush it correctly in the first place. And so we put them on notice that we had a problem with the way they crushed their rock. And it's not unusual that during the course of discovery, your claim turns out to be even better than you thought it was. And that's what happened is we discovered that what they put in the building pads was even worse than our general knowledge when we pleaded that they didn't crush the rocks the right way. And so one necessarily leads to the other, but we clearly put them on notice. We had a problem with the way they crushed the rocks. And then, so that satisfies due process. This was also brought to the trial judge's attention and she made a finding that this was preserved. But then in our interrogatory response and in our 558 notice, all along the way, we were very specific as to what our actual claim was. And those actually were quite specific as to the building pad. So it doesn't even sound like the opposing counsel anymore is even arguing surprise, which they could not argue surprise. They're arguing only notice, but we clearly mentioned crushing rock specifically. And we said, among other things, so we left it op open-ended that we had other problems. And then it's the failure to crush the rocks that led to the problem in the building pads. Okay. All right. Uh, you're so I would ask time. that you affirm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Ackerman, you got three minutes left. Thank you, Judge. Uh, let's start with Exhibit 80. Uh, relied heavily on my uh, opposing counsel and inquired of by both your honor and just uh, judge black. Uh, the credit in exhibit 80 that he talks about is not in the final judgment. Period. My statement and our argument is that the trial judge did not credit the FEMA elevations. Not that there's not a letter from KB home. If you compare paragraph one judge black, just as you were asking about, Right. That's one. That's one hundred percent of all of those change orders. Their own letter, Exhibit Eighty, acknowledges a credit. You'll find no math in the judgment because we don't agree with the proposed credit. But all you need to know to reverse is that they don't get one hundred percent when the words right out of their mouth is that at least fourteen thousand cubic yards more were required for FEMA. I said, and our argument is the trial judge didn't credit it. Not that KB Home didn't write a letter on the issue. Number two, on the rock crushing, there is not one shred of evidence from any of the experts attempting to trace the portion of the rocks that were the subject of that change order to any specific building pad, period. There is no evidence. No one even attempted to do that. RCO 17, and I would like to remind the panel, this is a $400,000 error. Look at paragraph one of the judgment, 1B, $566,000 this trial judge awarded him. That was a change order that was an add to my client of 170,000 bucks. It turned around getting tripled against my client based on what Mr. Lang described both in his brief and today as quote, a cover case. I have never heard of such a case. No such case is cited in any brief. 
I've been doing construction law a very long time and I never have heard of such a thing. There is neither evidence nor any legal doctrine whatsoever that would support the award of damages at triple the agreed to contract price. This is a signed change order. They agreed that a reasonable price for that dirt was $3.18. Their measure of damages is calculated at $3.18, not nearly triple that. If there are any further questions on the contract balance argument, I'll be happy to argue them. However, I do back on that one question uh, again, the three dollars and eighteen cents. Isn't that assuming? I mean, you all already have the equipment out there as part of your contract in a larger scale operation. You're assuming that somebody can just take that little portion of it, bring the equipment in, and somehow produce it for the same amount. It isn't that actually what you're arguing is because we could have done it for that they can find somebody else to do it for that well legally yes there's no case cited and none exists that i'm aware of that would support the measure well, damages award there were two options one was bringing it in from someone else and the other is dredging getting it somehow on site yes and you're saying because we were prepared to do it for three dollars and 18 cents by dredging it and having it here and there should be more that they're required to go find somebody else that can do it for $3.18, as opposed to what the market price is to have somebody haul it in. That is the correct legal measure of damages. And factually, Your Honor, there's no testimony in this record. There wasn't even a question in the entire trial about whether they had to go out on the open market to get this fill. Not, there's not a word in the trial transcript about this but entire issue. They, they were claiming it at the market fill price. Why wouldn't it be incumbent on you to come in and say, oh, but judge, somebody could do it for 318 or 550 or $7 if they would just come in and dredge the lake to the fills there. Why, oh. if they argued for it at the market rate, and that's what the trial judge said, this is what I've heard. Why shouldn't that be the amount of damages? Well, that is the most unfortunate part of the whole thing, judges. They didn't argue for it at this rate. This number mysteriously appeared in the proposed final judgments. There is neither evidence nor a finding nor even an argument that they should have gotten this rate. This is one of the many math problems that, that slipped through the cracks here. They made no such contention, so there was nothing for us to rebut. However, the fact that this developer has eagerly told this panel they're going to develop phases three and four, which are right next door, it certainly stands to reason that they can get the new contractor to go 10 yards over there and dig that pond for a quite similar rate. There's not a shred of evidence that they had to go on the uh, open market to get this bill. Okay, you are at the end of your time, sir. We want to thank you both. Thank and this you, concludes our um, court session for today. So court is adjourned. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you both. Thank you.